Let me confess this at the outset. Since last summer, I've begun to suspect that I suffer, I suffer from a curious and intriguing disorder of the brain. It's called bibliomania. And before you, you know, you suspect me already, let me tell you, it is an accepted psychological condition. Um, and it's, it's different from, say, other more dangerous uh, conditions such as bibliophagy, which is book eating, or bibliocleptomania, which is compulsive book stealing, or even uh, bibliotaphy, which is book bearing. What I suffer from is bibliomania. And let me tell you how I got there. So, so basically, bibliomania is this obsessive uh, hunger to collect books. Now, a bibliomaniac is a person who owns many, many more books than it's possible for them to read in their lifetime. Now, let me tell you how I became a bibliomaniac. It's, um, it kind of goes back into my past. And it'll also probably tell you how old I am, but then anyway, I'm turning 30 this year, so I might as well accept it. When I was a kid, my mother banned cable TV from the house. So, you know, I was one of those dorky kids in school. I would never have any idea what cool programs were, you know, were going on in, uh, in, uh, on TV, and the others would talk about it. So I would kind of pretend to be superior, and my mother, pushed me onto books. She thought it's like, you know, three birds with one stone, um, grammar, discipline, and uh, what do you call it? An appreciation of English manners. So little did she know that, you know, that um, I would rebel against all three pretty um, strongly in the course of my life and start pretty soon. However, now, so that was that. From the books, I did gather, uh, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of knowledge that at that time perhaps was a bit, uh, bit forward. For example, from all the Sidney Sheldon and Harold, Robin book, Harold Robbins books that I found in the library, I had quite an interesting appreciation, a bit imaginative though, of, uh, of sexual matters. Now, I could have used that to curry favors in school, but unfortunately, I was a bit, bit shy. So I remained the dork and I began my bibliomanic behavior. Now, what happened was that we had a lovely library in school and a nice warm space filled with books. And we were allowed to borrow one book per week. Um, by the time I was about 13, I discovered that, you know, one book didn't last me a week. And I began to suffer from this massive anxiety and I came up with a clever but devious plan to address this. So, um, so what I did instead was I convinced some of the other girls in my class, those who didn't borrow books from the library, that uh, you know, their mothers had told them it's a waste of time. They had to study. So, so I convinced them that you, know, you take out a book from the library in your name, and I'm going to take it from you and read it, and then it will be all cool and fine. You know? so, um, so I did that. And then one day in class, um, you know, I woke up in, uh, in the morning with a raging fever and my mother wouldn't let me go to school and that was the day of the library class. Another book, I have this book and I have another book. So anyway, so she considered that and, uh, and I was, as you can see, I was quite dramatic even then. Um, so then she gave me a cookie. She gave me a cookie and she said, okay, when um, on, on Friday at lunch hour, you come back and I'll let you borrow another book for the weekend. So, you know, so she sort of uh, put me on the straight and narrow again, um, repressed my criminal tendencies, delinquent tendencies at that age, um, to fund my uh, book addiction. And that's, so that was sort of, you know, becoming a bibliomaniac 101. The second step was when I went to college. I studied in a college called Presidency College in Calcutta, which is bang in the middle of College Street, which is book heaven, you know. So it's, um, it's a unique place in the world, really. There are booksellers and there are secondhand bookstores. You can get books for 20 rupees. There are proper bookstores. There are these, you know, uh, you get all these examination, question paper kind of things. You get lives of Lenin and Trotsky. You know, Calcutta is very lefty. And um, so you get 
you know, strange things like the curriculum of, say, a French finishing school. So that was what, you know, College Street did to me. It kind of made me a full-fledged, raging bibliomaniac. It helped that in college, I met uh, my soon-to-be husband, also a bibliomaniac. Now, he give, gave me a clever tip, which, you know, which, you know, um, I'll, I'll tell you what the tip was. He said that in College Street, most of uh, the booksellers are devout Muslims. So on Friday, just before the call to prayer at dusk, there's this one hour when they're really happy. They're, they're in a good mood. If you go then, that's when you get the best bargains, okay? So I decided to marry this evil genius, you know? <laughs> and now, so here was I, I was a bibliomaniac, I became a writer. You know, writers, I, I don't know, I get scared when I think of myself as a writer. I think of myself as a reader with a bit of a writing problem. So, so that was that. I was being, you know, I, I was continuing to accumulate my books, read them, and, and, and do a little bit of writing. When one day, and I was quite happy to be this, you know, um, this minor person doing my thing, um, not really head up about the world, the fast-changing world with all its other addictions. When one day, in our little writerly abode, my brother-in-law uh, came to visit. Now, a word about my brother-in-law. He is a corporate high flyer. He's this, you know, this big bus man sort of a guy. And uh, he hires people. He gives jobs to people. He, you know, he saves companies. And, you know, he talks about things like uh, market share and value addition. So, so basically, you know, he's kind of occupies the opposite uh, end of, you know, where I am, the vague woman. So, so there we are. The Delhi dusk is long and, and delicious, as you know. And we are drinking tea. And then he tells me that, uh, you know, what with all the technological boom and all the new media that has come up, I think the book is, you know, is, is on its last legs. So now you can imagine that it's a, this is a pretty dangerous thing to tell somebody whose own pitiful earnings comes from book writing and who's a bibliomania cannot, you know, live without, you know, books and the idea that there are more books to be read. So I obviously, my hands became cold, my ears began to prickle with heat, and I became all inarticulate and, um, you know, um, fighty all at once. So then began this whole question. And so now my brother-in-law, who also, you know, works with a large number of young people, and he gives these motivational talks and so on, he tells me that, give me, you know, a few reasons why I should really ask these young people to read. I meet lots of young people. Uh, why? And, and really, me, why should I read? Um, so quickly, to give a background, when I say read, I mean, you know, stuff that is not immediately deployable in the near future. So basically, reading as an end in itself, not, you know, for an exam or to, you know, to sort of, um, yeah, kind of, you know what I mean, right? So, um, so for a second, I, I, I know that, you know, this is it. This is my big chance. I have to tell him. Why, you know, why read? Why reading is important. So that's the moment when from a bibliomaniac, I become a biblioevangelist. I start saying, oh, read, 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 you know. And um, it's pretty clever because, you know, as you're going to say that, oh, yes, of course you want us to read. You're a writer. You know, you want books to sell. So nonetheless, I, I thought seriously about it. And I came up with two, you know, with two, two important reasons why I think everybody should read, read for, for pleasure. Um, the first, of course, is the idea of empathy, you know. Now, um, you know, in my other avatar, I, I'm, a, I'm a scholar, and I study the Natya Shastra, which is an ancient text of Indian drama. Now, the Natya Shastra is where the rasa theory is articulated, you know. It's the sort of a very important theory in, um, you know, Indian theory of meaning. So now, according to the, to the rasa theory, um, what happens when we are moved by a work of art, which could be literature, it could be a play, it could be music? Now, what, what happens? So this is an old question that it has been asked many times. And um, the, Rasa, the Nati Shastra offers one explanation. Now, let me give you a, a kind of a case study. Now, suppose somebody tells you about um, this, you know, this old couple that they know and they've lost their only child. And it's a really a sad, grim story. 
Now they tell you this when you're going to, when you're coming to college in the morning and you've not had breakfast and the bus is crowded and Delhi traffic is insane. And you tell them, you know you're being really morbid. Can you talk about cricket? So that's your response to this, this story when, you know, when somebody tells you. It's an ordinary enough story. And yet, when you read about this in a good book, you know, in a good book, and this, this is a classic example. It's a story uh, by, by Anton Chekhov. It's called Grief. So when you read it in a good book, or you watch a, a, a play, you're in an auditorium like this, and the lights are off, and you're sitting there, and you see it, and you find yourself crying. You see this old couple. You see their grief. You feel it. And you find yourself crying. Now, you know that these characters are fictional. You know that when the lights come on, they're going to come out and take a bow. But you are there, and there are real tears that you have shed. And perhaps you're a little embarrassed when the lights come on and the person next to you sees you crying. Now, that is why you must read. It, because when you shed real tears for fictional people, for others, people who don't exist, what you're actually doing is you're rising above the material conditions of your life. So if this auditorium is too cold, at that point, it ceases to matter. If the tickets were too expensive, if the seat is not comfortable, none of that matters. When you're reading a book, it doesn't matter what season it is outside or what you were supposed to do, were you supposed to cook or clean or whatever. All of that is immaterial. You are no longer in your life. You have risen to become part of something else. Why this is, and this is the reason why um, in, uh, in the Natya Shastra, the ideal reader is the Sahridaya. So a person who shares your heart, shares your heart at that moment. So that's, that's the moment that, you know, um, that is, you know, is the climax of good art. That's when Rasa Nishpati happens. Anyway, I'm not going to go all technical. I'm going to come back to what I mean. This, this feeling is also very important because when we deal with this world outside, you know, with our position in, in the world, we access it through narratives. Everything in the world comes to us through narrative, through stories. In this curious, strange tension between, you know, fictional characters, fictional circumstances, and real tears lie the possibility of your having accessed a moment when you're more than yourself, when your life is more than your life. And that's why read. So that's, that's one reason. Now the second reason, which is perhaps the more important reason, is that when you, as an individual, see yourself in the world, how do, you, how do you see yourself in the world? What is this world where we situate ourselves? Literature, and because of literature's ability to record truths that history may forget, that politics may want to repress. Literature is a storehouse of truths that tell us about your place in the world better. Now, for example, we Indians, we brown people, when we, you know, when we see ourselves in an Indian context, we're all, you know, brown. And therefore, I think we tend to, um, to not take into account the historic um, questions that have, that have shaped our identity. Colonialism, and perhaps more recently, neocolonialism and imperialism, which, which which is the fact of uh, an American age, the age in which we all live. So for example, I'll, I'll tell you that a book that changed my life is, is by an African writer called Chinua Achebe. The, the name of the book is Things Fall Apart. And it's the story of his uh, Igbo tribe uh, in, in Nigeria and the onset of colonialism and how the tribe and its identity fell apart from within. So here was I studying English literature and still studying primarily British authors, 
all the authors who had stood for the idea of civilization, which apparently colonialism brought to the rest of the world. Big lie if there was ever one. Um, so, that, so, so that book, it completely changed my world. It made me look at the world, the larger cosmos, differently. Another book that I read recently is by a, a Pakistani writer called Mohsin Hamid. It's called The Reluctant Fundamentalist, and it was made into a movie recently. I don't know if you saw the movie, but uh, it's a, it, it was a very powerful book because post 9-11, the identity of the brown man in America changed irretrievably. We Indians perhaps were not quite as much affected, but for the Muslim youth, it, it changed forever. And that's what the book is about. And that gave a unique perspective by bringing up the idea of Janissaries, you know. Who were, who were the Janissaries? There's a conversation between this guy who's the hero and, um, you know, and an old uh, bookshop owner whom he's going to put out of business because this guy, he's like a, you know, uh, he, he works in a big consultant firm. Anyway, so, uh, so this guy tells him, this old gentleman, that do you know about the Janissaries? The Janissaries were Christian youths who had been um, taken on by the Ottoman army, which was at that time the largest army in the world, and brought up as Muslims, their identity erased, and then they became the bravest, the sharpest soldiers of the Ottoman army. They were the Janissaries, because their own identity had been erased. They could be now whatever the tools of power wanted them to be. So I think it's very important in today's day and age that all of us resist being Janissaries. And one way to do that is to be constantly conscious of the forces of power that shape us from all sides. So okay, so I've given you two good reasons why you should read. And before, before I end, I'll just end quickly with um, by negating what I, I just said. Read for pleasure, you know. These are still reasons to read. These are still reasons to read, but ultimately, Read for pleasure, because where that pleasure comes in is that point of stasis. From that point of stasis, creative force takes over you, and you begin to create. So all of you, each one of us, is a creative entity. There are different things we create, including our own identities. So read to reach that point of silence from where you can shape yourselves. Thank you.